Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Now, in the lectures we've had up to now, we've looked at a whole series of human abilities. We've looked at the ability to make tools. We've looked at language. We've looked at culture. We've looked at various different ways in which uh, humans and other animals can engage in abstract thought. And basically, I don't think we reached any clear conclusions. Like, on the one hand, we find there are very few human abilities, if any, that aren't present in some reduced form in other animals, primarily in apes, but also even sometimes we find in crows or in, or in other mammals. On the other hand, we find that a, a lot of the things which we observe, humans do indeed do it much better. So chimpanzees can learn to make simple tools, can and do learn to make simple tools, and they use them in the wild, but uh, the tools they make are incomparably more simple than ours. Chimpanzees do, use, do have a repertoire of symbols they can use to communicate with each other via gestures, but that their repertoire of symbols is very, very small compared to the repertoire of symbols for human beings. Chimpanzees can learn skills, like they can learn to crush nuts. Um, you can have an anvil and a stone hammer. They can choose the right stone, crush the nuts, but it takes the mother four or five years to teach the chimpanzee this apparently very simple skill. And we're, I'm sure we all feel intuitively that a human, w a human child could learn this much faster. So on the one hand, we seem to have a lack of huge qualitative differences. On the other hand, we do have some very real, easily measurable quantitative differences. So the theme of today's lecture is what's going on in the hardware underneath. What sort of machine supports this and how can we explain both the similarities and the differences. So the first half of this lecture, I'm going to be talking about uh, neuroanatomy. I'm going to be talking about the brain, starting off at a very big level, just the size of the brain, and going down to a very fine level, the shape of our neurons, our spines, our synapses, and so on. The second half of the lecture, I'm going to be looking at the underlying code, the code which codes, codes for this, human genetics, and how far is human genetics similar to the genetics of other animals, our closest relatives, like, like the apes, and in what way could it be different? And again, I'm going to start off, start off on a very, very big level, the basic size of the genome, and go down to a fine level, and actually look at specific genes which have been alleged to be responsible for unique human abilities. So. Let's start off with the brain. And, oops, sorry, go back one. The first thing we should say is that even Aristotle knew that humans do not have the biggest brain on the planet. Whales, I've got here a pilot whale, but lots of different whales have brains which are significantly bigger than the human brain. Whales do, elephants do. There's really nothing very special about the overall size of the human brain. And Aristotle knew that. Aristotle said, what counts is not the absolute size of the brain. What counts is the size of the brain with respect to the body. So here we have some modern figures for what is I take the weight of the brain and I measure it as a percentage of the body. And yes, this shows me that humans do much better than whales and much better than elephants, and they do better than gorillas. It's a pity they don't do better than marmosets, which are not really believed by most people to be particularly intelligent animals. Though the Japanese are now doing lots of neuroscience with marmosets because they're convenient. You can breed them very fast. 
Uh, they're not expensive. And you can do lots of low-level cognitive tasks with marmosets. So it's not what makes us special is not the size of our brain compared to the body. Now, in the 40s and 50s, people decided we're, we're mathematicians, so we can, be, we can use a more sophisticated measurement than that. And a man called Jevison, uh, with support from Lashley, invented what he called the encephalization quotient, EQ, which is a, a concept which you still see quoted today. So what did he do? He, got body, he plotted the log of body size on one axis, the log of brain size on the other axis, and he did a regression line going through a few species, maybe not enough, and then he calculated the residuals of the regression. So do I have more or less than I would be expected to have just on the basis of the general, in the general regression line? And he found that humans, had, he, he defined this, uh, the encephalization quotient, and humans had the highest one, which was nice. Humans had an encephalization quotient of seven, dolphins had it of four, we all sort of believe that dolphins are pretty clever, whales had it 2.4, whales might be pretty clever, but then we get some problems. Because then we find that macaques, or rather that marmosets, do better than gorillas? And do we really believe that marmosets have their 90 gram gr brain and gorillas have a 500 gram brain? And this again, it sort of casts doubt on the measure. And there's other anomalies too. These are just the ones I wanted to put on the board. So this measure too, you sort of think, well, is this actually measuring, even if humans do very well on it, is it actually measuring anything useful? And you could think of, you think of it in another way. Think of the brain as a computer. And the computer comes in a case, and it has certain hardware, certain number of transistors and things. And um, the encephalization quotient says, do I have more transistors than I'd expect for the case? Well, is that, does that really tell me anything about the computational power of the computer? It would probably tell me when the computer was built. Because if the computer was built 30 years ago, I'd have relatively few transistors. I'd have uh, low encephalization, if you like. And if it was recent, I'd have a lot more. I'd have more high encephalization. But I think very few computer scientists would take those measurements as a measurement of anything to do with computers. It's more or less coincidental. So this measurement doesn't work very well either. New hero. There's a very wonderful, I, I, I very much admire her, a Brazilian uh, neuroscientist called Herculano Husel, Susana Herculano Husel. Have any of you heard? The neuroscientists, yes. So she is very interested in measuring the brain. And she takes a measure of the brain which is much more interesting than size. It's how many neurons do you have? Now this is, for the computer scientists, this is intuitively pretty meaningful. If I get... An Apple computer from 1970, it has one processor. Let's say one neuron. I take it today, it might have eight. They're a bit faster too. And if I go to the Blue Gene supercomputer, we use a TPFL, it has several hundred thousand. And those things really do correlate with computational power. My modern computer with eight processors, eight cores, you would say, has much more power than my old one with one. And the Blue Gene with its several hundred thousand really does have a lot of power. So sort of just intuitively from a computational point of view, it's not rigorous, number of neurons counts. Now question, how can I count how many neurons there are? And this is not obvious because I can take the brain, I can take a sample, normally people used to take samples, and yes, I can stain the neurons and I can count them, but that doesn't give me the whole brain. Uh, I might go to a part where the neurons are very dense, and that way I'm going to get an overcount. I might go to a part where they're less dense, and that way I'm going to underestimate. Herculana Husel asked herself, how can I count the total number of neurons in the brain, or in a given part of the brain, like the cortex, or the cerebellum, or the prefrontal cortex? So she devised this thing, which I think is supremely ingenious, because it's simple. It's so simple. So she gets the brain, and she gets 
a slightly sophisticated version of a kitchen mixer, and she converts the brain into soup. So she goes, Zzz, and the brain becomes soup. And obviously we can measure the volume of that soup. So in the case of humans, the volume will be about 1,450 cc's. Great. You can then, she then takes a proportion of that. So if she takes 1% of it, but I'm inventing the number, it's not the real number, you know that if you can count the neurons in that portion of soup, if, you mul if it's properly homogeneous, if you then multiply by 100, you get the number of neurons in the brain. So that's what she actually does. She takes a sample of the brain. It works just as well for a part of the brain. Uh, she makes it into the soup. She takes a sample of it. And then she stains it. She uses a new N. She stains it. And with that, the neurons actually appear. And as she's got a relatively small sample, she can count the number of neurons in the sample. She then multiplies by the fraction. So the sample is 1% of the brain. Let us say she multiplies by 100. And that gives her the number of neurons in the brain. She can repeat this process as often as she likes. And if by repeating it several times, you can also get a standard error. So you know you have a mean number of neurons, plus or minus so many. And this is a real count. And to my knowledge, no one has ever contested the numbers she gets. So this is regarded as being more or less consolidated, consolidated uh, knowledge. And she's been publishing on this. She published her method in 2005 or 2006. I can't quite remember. And then slowly she's been going through brains, getting it, working out um, how many neurons there are in the brains of different species. And she very quickly did humans, and she found 86 million. And in the first of the other animals she looked at, they were all smaller. So this was nice. Humans had more neurons than, let's, uh, than gorillas, say, which she has 33 million. Uh, more neurons than whales, more neurons than macaques lots more neurons than marmosets. So we seem to have, we have here a, ca a measurement, a metric, which s correlates intuitively with what we sort of think is the relative intelligence of animals. It's not, again, it's not rigorous because we, we don't have a single rigorous intelligence test, but it sort of sounds reasonable. And this was a beautiful story until February 2014, when she finally got her hands on an elephant brain. Now, actually, there's a 2006 paper in which she predicts that the elephant brain will have 28 billion neurons. A pity she was off by an order of magnitude. Um, that was just a prediction from regression lab. Uh, she actually found that elephants have 257 billion neurons. That's three times as many as we do. Which, sort of intuitively first glance would make it seem if this is a measure of intelligence, elephants are much better than we are. Uh, not necessarily true. On further analysis, she found that the anatomy of the elephant brain was really deeply different from the anatomy of the human brain. In particular, the human cortex did have lots more neurons than the elephant cortex. Nearly all these neurons in the elephant brain were in cerebellum which she speculatively suggests could be, to, could be due to having very fine representations of the elephant's trunk. The elephant uses this both as a sensing device and as a motor device, but this is not proven. This is her own speculative idea. But so, neurons, it does seem that if we make this one exception for elephants and then elephants don't have a big cortex, if we take the whole brain or if we take the size of the cortex, humans usually do much better. So I think one thing we can say is these quantitative differences which we see uh, between different forms of human cognition and cognition in other animals are at least correlated, this doesn't prove causation, but are correlated with a difference in the number of neurons in the brain. And that, and that has a nice evolutionary perspective because to completely rebuild a brain circuit probably requires a huge amount of genetic change. And later we're going to see there's no evidence for that sort of change. But to make it just bigger probably requires relatively little genetic change. So this could explain how, 
in 7 million years from our last shared ancestor compared to chimpanzees, our brain got three times bigger. A uh, chimpanzee brain is about 500 cc's, ours is about 1400. And the number of neurons, our number of neurons grows more or less proportionally with that. I'm going to talk about proportions later on. So this would give us a neat evolutionary explanation for what we're observing. Something has happened genetically which allows us to grow bigger. And this can be, in, in genetic terms, it might be simply some gene which allows us to develop for more time. It can be something as simple as that. Imagine a computer program. I do so many loops. Instead of doing 10 loops, I do 30 loops. That's a very small change in the computer program. But it can give you a much bigger output. So that is, gives us some initial uh, insight into what might be happening. But we can get more insight if we start comparing different orders. So Herculano Husel again. Yes. Uh, so, you c no one today, to my knowledge, has any way of measuring total number of synapses in the brain. Uh, you can do, uh, you can do micro electro electroscopy and measure synapses in very small tissue slabs. In fact, we do this in the Human Brain Project, and we're just about to publish a paper with our own estimate of synapse numbers. But to my knowledge, this hasn't been done across species. And even our own stuff is not human, it's, uh, it's mouse. So... I don't think those numbers exist. To my knowledge, those numbers don't exist, at least at the whole brain level. No, not for the orders. Yeah. I know. I, 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 I talk a lot with Javier de, de Felipe. And we're going to see, talk about later about spine densities and these things. I, I'm going from the top down. So, I'm, so spine density, you will actually find there are more spines on human neurons, which implies probably there are more synapses as well. And there's a good anatomical reason for that. We'll come to it. Not there yet. So, uh, the normal assumption was that the number of neurons just increases linearly with brain size. But Herculano Husel then started, using her fractionator technique, she started actually making measurements for lots of different species for fairly good ethical reasons, mainly not great apes. She worked a lot on lower primates. She worked a lot on, uh, on rodents, on insectivores, and so on. And she started drawing regression lines. So I have on this axis, I have the number of brain neurons, and here I have the number of the brain mass on the vertical axis. And what she found was that the same increase in brain mass, in you can get a much bigger increase in the number of neurons out of the same increase in brain mass if you are a primate than if you are a rodent, or even more, if you're an insectivore. So, uh, my brain doubles. If I'm, a, if I'm a primate, I can get a lot more neurons out of that. If I'm a rodent, I don't get many. In fact, she sort of cites in her paper, uh, 2009 paper, she says that if you scaled up a rodent brain to the size of the human brain, or sorry, no, if you scaled up the number of neurons in, the neuron, in a rodent brain to the number of neurons you have in the human brain, it would weigh 35 kilos. And this just ain't practical. You'd have to feed it, you'd have to carry it, you need your muscles. So what you get is there's a fundamental design difference between the primate brain and the rodent brain. And the primate brain can pack in more neurons, therefore presumably more computing power in less space. Again, let's go back to our computing paradigm. Imagine the old days where computers had individual, individual uh, transistors or very small chips, very small chips with very small transistor counts. If you wanted to make a modern, um, a, a modern supercomputer, it would have taken the whole, the whole area of Jerusalem to put it, and you needed so much power that the earth couldn't have powered it. Today we have much cooler designs which enable us to scale up, to make a bigger brain with many more chips in much smaller space and consuming much less power. And this is a fundamental engineering change which allows us to build bigger computers. Same thing changing from rodents to primates. Primates manage to put, pack more power into less space with less energy consumption and that allows them to evolve further. Because if you were using the rodent rules, sooner or later just the size of your head 
and the amount of energy it takes to run it is going to stop you evolving any further. So maybe humans aren't so unique, but primates very definitely did make some enormous innovations, which were very important. Let's slight go down a level. So far we've been talking about total size of the brain. But there's a lot of talk about specific parts of the brain. I'm going to choose one of them, frontal cortex, also pre prefrontal cortex. It was of it's often been claimed that humans evolved prefrontal cortex or frontal cortex much faster than other animals. You'll find this in a whole literature going up to the early 1990s. You'll find this claim very, very often indeed. It's a claim which at least the data I'm showing here suggests is completely false. So, uh, Barton and Venditti did this, did this model in which they looked at how many times uh, different parts of the brain have changed compared to the other parts of the brain. And they corrected for phylogeny. So, if you were uh, evolutionarily uh, related to another species, they put that into the regression. So you automatically inherited some of the, some of the, um, some of the size of your predecessors. So what did they find? They found certainly that, as we see in diagrams A and B, here, here we have fold increase. So this means that this part of the brain increased one-fold, two-fold, three-fold, four-fold, five-fold. White is human. So, in absolute terms, in A, let me remind myself what A is. Uh, where is A? Absolute white matter. In absolute terms, absolute white matter increased five times in humans. So, that's a big absolute increase. We have a bigger computer. White matter is fibers. So, white matter, we're talking about connect long distance connectivity within the brain. We look at the gray matter in B. Again, we have a nine times absolute increase. So this seems absolutely enormous. But if you then take a different metric and you measure it compared to the other parts of the brain, you find that the humans, that's this little white strap, there is no change in the relative size of the white matter. And there's only a very small change in the relative size of the, red, of the, of the gray matter. So there's no great increase in, neuro in the neurons in the prefrontal cortex compared to the rest of the brain. And there's no great increase in its connectivity. So, you know, human, why are we interested in prefrontal cortex? Because there's all sorts of higher functions which we associate with prefrontal cortex. Executive function, um, all sorts of things. Language and so on. So it, this idea that the human prefrontal cortex is somewhat special false again. But from the top two graphs, yes, it is very big. So the message is, we have followed the fundamental primate design pattern. Just like my, my personal computer today is very similar to an IBM PC from 1980. But at the same time, we've made it much bigger. We've got many more computing units in it. And that is evolutionarily simple. And so this is, this is further evidence for the idea it's the increase in size and power rather than a fundamental change in design which underlies special human abilities. Uh, this shows basically it's the same data again. What we see is... It would be nicer if we could read it. That is really problem. Uh, the bottom size of the screen is always permanently out of focus. I don't know why. Uh, what we see is that you can predict the size of the human frontal cortex just from the normal regression line for all other primates. So again, this is further. It comes from the same paper. It's further evidence that humans just follow a standard primate <coughs> design pattern. They call it allometric growth. Allometric means that uh, different parts of the brain can grow at different speeds. But what it's saying is that the equation for that growth is the same for all primates. So prefrontal cortex grows faster than the rest of the brain in all primates, not just in humans. Let's go to a different indicator. 
Um, sorry, that's the one we had already. Let's go to a different indicator, which is total large-scale large scale connectivity. Again, you can look at the total volume of white matter in the prefrontal cortex, and again, you can see that it just, it just follows the normal rules for primates. So there is really nothing special. I won't labor that point anymore. Let's take something else. Again, there's a lot of false claims in this. Yes? Why do you assume that I... I, I don't... Uh, well, total volume of white matter is total volume of cables. And I would normally assume that the more you're connected, uh, the, the more computations you can do. More is, a, more is a good first, first estimate. Uh, so that gives you a repertoire. You can, uh, and you don't prime fibers. Fi fi prune fibers. fibers. Fibers are your basic wiring. So if there's no cables there, you can't use them. If the cables are there, you might decide not to use some of them. That's okay. But I think that gives you a, an upper limit on what you can connect. But this is not really rigorous theory. I have to admit it's their heuristics. You know, we think... So a lot of neurons, having a lot of neurons is probably good. We think that having, having them well connected is probably also good. But there is no, to my knowledge, there is no rigorous, well-grounded theory of computational neuroscience which will prove that is true. Well, I'm coming to pruning later on, this lecture. Be patient. Uh, uh, strange things happen, happen in adolescence. Anyone who has an adolescent kid knows. Um, you said that there was no cognitive index on activity. Like how is there no index on activity? No, how do you mean no difference in connectivity? I, th I was talking about uh, the volume of white matter compared to the rest of the brain. Relative volume. In absolute volume, there's lots more. Yeah, so no. absolute a lot, relative no. And actual connectivity, fibers don't measure connectivity. If I want to actually measure connectivity, I have to go and, go and do... Um, twin neuron recordings in electrophys because it's the only way I can get that data. Fibers have an indication of connectivity, but they're not actual electrical connectivity. So, let's go to a different measure. Another common claim you can find in the literature way up into the beginning of the 2000s is that humans have an unusual number of glial cells. I can find you lots of quotations for that. Uh, some, some people actually claim they had ten times as many. It appears these claims, there are two, there's two things you can say about them. One, there was an ideological background. Lots of glial cells means lots of energy. This gives you lots of energy for the brain, um, and it was believed that the human brain was used much more than silly little primate brains, and therefore it was obvious that students and human beings would use more energy than poor little gorillas and chimpanzees and things like that. Uh, not true. That was the ideology, and possibly the methodological problems were just sampling in strange bits of the brain, because it's perfectly possible this is true if you just take small samples. So using um, Herculano Husserl's method, Azevedo, in 2009, actually counted neurons versus non-neural cells, which are mainly all glia. And he found that basically the number is the same. And he found a one-to-one -one ratio in other primates as well. So we're not special in that either. Again, we're more powerful. We're bigger. So we have more, we have more glial cells than anybody else, but it's always a one-to-one -one ratio compared to neurons. So in... I should know, and I don't. Sorry. I, I could find it you for t tomorrow, but I don't know that. Uh, uh, elephant, I'm not even sure if it's known. I could read... In, in the bibliography, there is the Herculano Husel paper on elephants. I could read that, but I wasn't reading it with glia in mind. Yeah, I'm sure that's true. Because, uh, you know, these people didn't invent the number when they said there was a tenfold increase. It just depends where you sample. No, I mean yeah, uh, he said it was more, more in prefrontal. Okay. 
we'll take that. So, uh, you get another change, which you get with larger brains. And this gets us onto our connectivity, onto our connectivity thing. It appears, there's a fairly straight line, you see it on the graph. This is my own graph here, not because I publish on these things, I just calculated it from data which appears in the Heckel and Husel papers. Uh, it appears there's a fairly straight line between the log, I was, I was calculating here the log of brain mass and the number of neurons. Is that the right? I, I can't read my own graph here. Let me just look at it on here. I can't read it here either. Uh, our brain mass versus, no, density, versus neuron density. I apologize. So the larger the brain, the lower the density of neurons. And this actually has, uh, that means there's more space between the neurons. And that leaves more space for the formation of, of synapses. So if you have a larger brain, this means that the number of synapses can scale more than proportionally. And again, having synapses is probably a good thing. And this is some of the things which the, uh, the measurements of synapses we're just putting in our new paper uh, submitted to cell. I hope it, hope it works. Uh, the measurements of synapses come from De Filippi's work. We've done it both in modeling and we've done it in, elect in uh, electromicroscopy and the figures match. So we're quite happy. Is limited by brain volume. Well, sy syna synapse. Why do you say, why do you okay, say synapse that? numbers depends on numbers of boutons. And given a given bouton density, there you can multiply that by the number of neurons. A number of neurons is related to brain size. So by a long chain, you yes, bigger brains will have more synapses. Yeah. No, no, actually, actually we prune our We don't prune boutons. We respect bouton densities. We, pr we prune our positions. So what we actually, this is, sorry, this is magic for people who don't know blue brain. Uh, we, we model the morphologies of neurons. We put them together in a virtual space. And the first thing is we do is we, we detect what we call an apposition. These are all the places where, where a, a synap, um, the, um, axonal arborization comes in contact with the dendritic arborization at a certain minimum distance. We usually use 2.5 microns. So that gives you a huge repertoire of appositions. These are the places where it is biologically possible for a synapse to form. But actually the number of boutons is much smaller than that. So there's, uh, there's other steps I'm missing out, but we adjust the number of synapses down to respect bouton densities. But bouton densities is a real constraint. So, we have lower we have lower neuron densities, and um, this makes space for for synapses. Uh, so so we find actually that if you consider human pyramidal cells, which are the most common cells, they're exc excitatory cells in the prefrontal cortex, they have seven. This is uh, De Filippi data. They have 72 percent more dendritic spines, that means more possibilities of forming, of forming synapses than macaque cells and uh, four times more dendritic spines than cells from squirrel monkey or mouse motor cortex. So it does seem that you can have a repertoire of synapses which is much larger. So you're getting multiple, you're getting multiple um, multipliers here. You're multiplying because you've got more neurons in the first place. Then you're multiplying again because you've got more space for these neurons and you've got more synapses on each one. So this is, this is rising very fast. There's one or two words of caution. These studies have so far used only very, very few species. So we really have to treat them a little delicately. It's possible that future studies will, will, cause, us to, um, will cause us to revise our estimates. And so it's very new work. And second, we don't yet have any clear indication of the relationship between synapse numbers and learning abilities. Like we're, we're all Hebbians, so we believe that synapses are involved in learning. This is a sort of basic dogma. 
but to sort of say that with twice as many synapses I can learn faster or better, mm. and I can put a number on that, I think that's beyond what anyone can do today. I'm not sure that speed of plasticity is good. Could you? Well, uh, this would be a challenge. If someone, it would be a wonderful work if someone could do it, but to mine, I've not seen a proof of that. But it's, I think it's a, sort of qu it's, a, it's a totally legitimate question. And I think you can attack it both experimentally and theoretically. You go, you pro probably a good result would use both theory and, and experiment. I don't think those experiments have been done, unless someone can illuminate me. Yeah. How many of how many? Roughly how many cells were looked at together with the vegetables in the vegetables? These. I know in, in the blue brain modeling it's uh, about just over thirty thousand cells. And, uh, and in the in the tissue blocks, I don't know because I always see density numbers. I'm not sure what the absolute number was. It's it's of that order of magnitude. So it's just a percentage of one percent of what is Of a human. We were working in mouse anyhow. So it's very, very small. And, and, and the blue brain stuff is done on somatosensory cortex. So we, we can't necessarily say it's the same number as some other part of the brain. And it's, done on, it's also done on very young mice. Uh, we might get some more synapses forming later. They're done on 15-day-old mice. So it's a, bit, it's a bit early. Now, one, there was a claim that humans have some special... Uh, cells, phoniconomal neurons or, or spindle cells, which in some early claims people said this is amazing, this is going to give all sorts of special abilities to humans. You can look them up in Wikipedia if you like. Personal communication from uh, De Felipe, we can find, he's found them in goats, deers, and now other people have found them in elephants. Uh, they tend to come form largely in large brains but that no one has shown that they have any functional significance or anything particularly important or, or any link to sort of advanced cognition. You get it in animals who probably do not have advanced cognition. So, special cells in humans also. Of course, no one can ever exclude in science. Someone will find them tomorrow morning. But to date, we haven't. Now, having said all that, all this sounds very much debunking all the things the human, where the human brain isn't special, apart from science. But someone mentioned pruning earlier, and this is a, a key topic. The human brain does have an extremely special life history. And uh, Stephen Jay Gould used to talk about neoteny. In other words, humans conserve, after birth, many features which in other animals develop before birth. We are extraordinarily immature when we're born. We have a smaller portion of the total... The, the brain is a smaller proportion of its total adult size than it is in a chimpanzee. In the first year of growth, the human brain grows much faster than... Um, than, than, um, than the chimpanzee brain. Uh, I don't know why I wrote late synapse mutation. What I mean is late synapse pruning. We prune um, our synapses much later. We myelinate. I'm very proud to say we carry on myelinating probably into our 60s, which is a very good thing, I promise to all of you. Um, and our white matter as we grow increases by a factor of about 60. Now, this is great because this really gives us a physiological idea of how humans can learn so much. All of these changes, late prune, uh, growth when you're already in the world, late pruning, late myelinization, all these things uh, seem, seem intuitively to favor learning from the environment and learning from the culture in which you're in. So this enables, it's, again, not proven, but it seems very plausible indeed that this explains why humans learn so much from their culture compared to what other animals appear to learn from there. Second, uh, you can explain these things 
with relatively small genetic changes. Again, imagine your computer just doing a slightly longer loop. You just have a developmental delay which probably doesn't require huge numbers of mutations. But it can have a massive effect on the way your synapses form and are pruned over your life history. And this, I think we could all agree, is something which is extremely significant. If we, if we look at synaptic pruning, uh, here we see figures for humans in layer 3 pyramidal cells and layer 5 pyramidal cells. The blue one is layer 3, uh, the red one is layer 5. And we see that you're still above ceiling way up in, into your 30s and 40s. So you've still got synapses you can prune, which we think pruning is associated with learning. So humans are learning late into life. You know, when, when, when chimpanzees are often dead. And, this is, and, and I've not seen equivalent graphs for chimpanzees, but I think everyone says that this is, you, you get your peak much, much earlier. Yeah, when I look at my screen with proper definition, yes. You'll get this properly when you get the slides. Uh, so if we just look at the, at the first graph on graph A, these are basal dendrites. The horizontal axis is, is, is age, age by years. Uh, the data points are there, and this is a, the curves are a regression on that, and you're measuring, I wish I could see it better, it's horrible, It's some synapse, or I think it's synapse density on the basal dendrites. But I, I can't swear because I can't read it properly. So this, pe so this peaks over, we get to about five up here. Peaks, but then declines really, really slowly. Now we get similar effects for this on, on gene expression associated. Sorry, I've missed one. So uh, the, author, the authors here, Liu and Sommel, uh, got a, did a whole sort of cluster analysis on gene expression. So we're, we're, we're measuring RNA levels uh, on lots of different genes. They did all the genes. And they clustered, they clustered them into different groups according to when they were co-expressed. So, so if my level went up and down together with somebody else's level, I went into the same cluster. And they made one cluster called cluster one, and they, s and they saw where this was expressed in humans, chimpanzees, and macaques. And I think the sim this is the curve of expression with respect to years, where the reds are the humans, the greens are the macaques, and the blues are the chimpanzees. So again, in these, in these module, module one genes, which are, which are connected to synaptic expression, the humans peak much, much later than the other animals. And you can see that more clearly in this graph here, where you actu it actually shows peak expression in years. In the, chimpan in the chimpanzee, it's between the age of zero and one. In the macaque, it's in the first month of life. And in the humans, it's around five. So that's a big, big difference in patterns of gene expression. The same genes are expressed in all three animals, but the time course of expression is drastically, but drastically different. And again, this seems to be connected in some way, or it's intuitive that it's connected with learning. Let's look at myelinization. If you, if myelinization is, you know where you form myelin around the ner nerve fibers, this makes, this makes the nerve fibers connect uh, faster, uh, I mean con conduct faster. If we look at chimpanzees, 20% of the nerve fibers are, are myelinated before birth, the proportion of myelinated fibers increases steadily until sexual maturity and then stays more or less the same. If you look at humans, there's none of them are myelinated before birth, at least according to this study. Uh, you get a slow increase in childhood. You get maturation expend it, it continuing well beyond adolescence. The slowest part is in prefrontal cortex, which is interesting because we know that adolescence drastically change their behavior and at puberty and this is linked to the prefrontal cortex and uh, 
This is interpreted that it's really a change in the biological life history between humans and chimpanzees. Chimpanz humans, again, it's neoteny. We mature really slowly. And this allows us to learn things that chimpanzees never have time to learn. So, this is basically what I have to say about the brain. Uh, yes? I don't think there's any, to my knowledge, I, I don't know if one of the neuroscientists wants to respond. To my knowledge, there's no advantage except that you can still rewire it until, as long as it's there. It's, it, it, when it's not myelinated, it's not available for, for rewiring. So when it is myelinated, it's fixed. Yeah, can, does, does someone know more about this than I do? Yeah. So the more input you actually have, the more the harder it is to see. Okay. It will make less stomach sense or it's like a more abstract thing. Or be less or be, be less easily pruned. Right. So a lot of the change is taking things away, it's not just adding things. So summarizing what we've been saying about the brain, I would argue that we have a scaled up version of a primate brain, but with many more neurons, if you like, many more processes. We do have a large frontal cortex and a large prefrontal cortex. In absolute terms, it's larger than any other primate, but it obeys normal primate scaling rules. We have a one-to-one -one ratio of neurons and glia. We have low neuron densities, but we have high connectivity. And fundamentally, big important difference, we have neoteny, we develop slowly, we continue developing even when we are relatively old. And this is a big, big difference compared to other primates. Now obviously all this, or most of it, is coded in the genome. So I'd now like to switch, switch theme and move from the brain to the basic code underlying it. Now... First, uh, first uh, elementary, really elementary. You, are any of you not biologists? A few. So when I was young, they used to say, well, humans are very complex animals, so we must have a very big genome. And uh, other animals must have very s proportionately smaller genomes. This is complete rubbish. Uh, our genome has about 3 billion base pairs. Rodent genome is fundamentally the same. But if you go, if you want a really big genome, you want to go to, ma to, to maize, American corn, then you get a really big genome. Or you can go to some mollusks have, have genomes which are much bigger than ours. So first, like this wretched lungfish, which has, has a huge genome, 139 billion base pairs, you know, God knows why, but it does. They probably have lots of chromosome duplications, but that's beside the point. So, human specialness has nothing but nothing to do with the crude size of our genome. Let's go. Yeah. Yeah. Well, of course, that is also a very, very, how much is coding. Uh, but nowadays, if you, if you, you know that if in, in the modern vision of the genome, it's very likely there's relatively little is non-functional. You know, these are the latest results from ENCODE. They would claim just about everything is functional in one way or another. So how much is coding for proteins? I don't actually have those figures. But I think you'll find for rodents it's very similar to us. Okay, thanks. Thanks. I know, I know our genome counts keep on going down. So 10 years ago we had 30,000 genes. Now we have... 17, 20,000 genes or something, it's still going down. But the regulatory networks are expanding. People are finding more and more things which have a regula regulatory role. So, for the non bio very, very quick tutorial, which I apologize to the people who don't need it. Uh, how, does, how do genomes change? 
when I was a computer scientist, I used to be a computer scientist, and we used to believe that all genomes, all change, were just single point mutations in bases. Well, that, that mechanism does exist, but it's only one of many mechanisms. So, you can take one of your base pairs, and you can change one base with another base. That's the simplest possible thing you can do. You can have insertions. You can get a whole piece of DNA, and you can insert it in the middle of the DNA. That's, this is called... And you can have deletions. You can have a whole piece of DNA, and you can take it away. You can have duplications at various levels. You can have a whole segment of a gene. You can have a whole gene. You can have a whole chromosome, which just duplicates. You have two of them instead of one. Uh, you can have very, very large-scale large scale rearrangements. Uh, humans actually have one chromosome less than chimpanzees. We can have transposons. We can have little repeating elements, you know, AG, 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 which just swap around and move around around the genome, making, rearranging things. <coughs> and I don't, I don't think that's actually an exhaustive list of everything which can happen either. So there are a very large number of ways in which we can change our genome, and that's necessary background information uh, for what comes next. So, de novo gene. What, a, a, what is de novo gene? A de novo gene is a sequence of DNA which, code, uh, which um, was not there before or which was not functional before. So, if, for instance, you can get a non-functional gene, a pseudo gene, which doesn't produce any protein, you can rearrange it and suddenly it starts producing a protein. We're talking about here genes, we're talking about coding sections of the DNA. Uh, uh, Wu et al., in a paper which they published, which I reference here, found there were probably about 60 completely new genes in humans compared to uh, other primates. But interestingly, they're not mainly expressed in the brain. And later on, I'm going to show some gene expression data. Most of the novelty is actually in our genitals, in the testes. So our, re our pattern of reproduction has changed, possibly more than our brain has changed. Uh, genetic events and human cognition. This was a very nice paper I recommend to you. It's very clear, and very, easy, very easy to read. So we know from sort of basic theory that most people believe that most genetic change is detrimental. You have a mutation, nearly always it makes you less fit, and nearly always there's purifying selection getting rid of it, so it just disappears. Then you can have beneficial uh, mutations, which do cause an increase in fitness. But a lot of the, now the beneficial mutation starts off in just one animal, and the huge majority of these get lost to genetic drift very early on. So if you've got one animal or five animals who have the mutation, most times those animals will just die without passing the mutation on to anybody else, even if it's beneficial, just by the drift in population size. So Liu and so on calculated that since the emergence of anatomically modern humans, given what we know about the, the number of uh, beneficial mutations you get, there's probably been about 700 beneficial mutations. And all but 14 have probably been lost to drift. This is just for mathematical modeling. It's, it's, this, it, these are not experimental data. And so he, and given it, when you get one of these mutations, it takes about 50,000 years to fixate in the population. Therefore, he calculates that the number of big genetic events in human evolution is of the order of four. The number isn't important. It could be 10. But what he's saying is there's been relatively few. Now, again, think of all those people who think we've completely rewired our brain, for instance, to have language. How the hell can four genetic mutations do that? It can't. It's just not possible in engineering terms. I can have a genetic mutation which makes something grow bigger, something grow longer, uh, which can give me immunity to a disease where, I wasn't, where, where, where previously I suffered maybe make something go a bit faster. That's what a mutation can do, and it can change our lives by doing so. But to completely rebuild a part of our anatomy with this number, even if it was multiplied by 10, with this number of mutations, 
goes beyond anything which biology teaches us can actually happen. Uh, if, we can, if we compare humans with chimpanzees and with mice, what do we find? We find that compared to chimpanzees, the differences are pretty small. Uh, we have had this reduction of chromosomes. There's one chromosome. Chimpanzees have one more than we do. Uh, we have a certain number of about 1%, a bit more than 1% of our genome has been changed with single nucleotide substitutions. 1% is not a lot. Uh, that you, people used to say this was all the change there was, but now we know that with insertions and deletions, there's also been quite a lot of, quite a lot of change. And these transposable elements, which this is, this is really an ongoing story, uh, people are seeing they have a much bigger role than they used to have. They're now implicated in several diseases. The human genome seems to have more of them than the chimpanzee genome. But the, chi the differences are not that big. If, on the other hand, we look at mouse, well, then we find really... I'm not going to go through all the, everything I've put on the board. We find really big differences. So it's easy... And we've seen that elsewhere. We saw that, for instance, the brain scales in humans completely different to the way it scales in rodents. It's a different design plan. So it's hardly surprising that the code that expresses that design plan is seriously different. But if you look at the chimpanzees, if you look at our closest, if you look at our closest uh, relatives, then you find, yes, there are changes. 5% is not negligible. It's far more than you'll ever get between two human groups. But... It's not that much. Now, Kaitovic, who has done, and Ennard, who are some of the strongest researchers in this area, say this. I'd like to read it because it really speaks to my exceptionalism argument. From our knowledge of other primates and other mammals, these are exactly the differences that one would expect for a pair of primate species that share a common ancestor five to seven million years ago. This shows that human evolution did not require any genetic changes that are qualitatively different from those expected given our current knowledge of molecular evolution. In other words, in my language, humans are different, they are unique, just like cockroaches, but we're not exceptionally different. We're not exceptionally, exception, exceptional, at least not in terms of our genetics and our neurobiology. There's another very cool method we can use for looking at human genetic evolution, which is to look for genes which have been positively selected for in humans. In other words, genes which are under positive selection pressure. And here we have a very, very cool method. Now, when you translate a DNA sequence into proteins, or into amino acids, more to the point, you can have synonyms. So that you can have two, three, four different sequences, sequences, codons, sequences of three bases, which translate to the same amino acid. So if I do a mutation which changes from one of those into another, where they're both synonyms, it has no functional significance. It produces exactly the same amino acid as before. That's called a a synonymous mutation, and it's, fully, and it's selectively neutral. It doesn't make you fitter, it doesn't make you worse, it does nothing. By measuring that, by measuring rates of mutation in synonymous mutations, we have a molecular clock, because there is no selection pressure there. Now we can take another gene, which is non-synonymous. In other words, you change, you, you change one of the nucleotides, and it does produce a different amino acid. And there we get a different rate of change. If it changes faster, or if, 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 we, if the number of these increases faster than the, um, uh, than the um, synonymous one, we know there is select... Well, sorry, let's, let's try again. Uh, if, if the number of these genes goes down compared to the controls, you know there's negative selection against it. If it goes up, you know there's positive selection. So I can see, sim I can see whether a certain gene is being positively selected for 
or negatively selected for, or whether it's neutral. So we look at this, and we can identify individual genes which are, which are being selected for more in humans. What do we find? PSG means positively selected genes. We actually find the number of genes in which there is positive selection is higher in chimpanzees than in humans. So this idea that humans have evolved faster, false. Uh, we have a common ancestor, and chimpanzees have been evolving pretty fast. We have also, in, we have also evolved, and this gives us the rates of that. You can look at it when you look at the slides, you'll find it. So humans have not evolved faster, and if we actually look where there is positive selection, yes? No, no. You're looking. You're looking. You're looking at current genes, and you're measuring it. And you you trace the phylogeny back. So you're going back over seven million years. Now this is not. You don't do it in the lab and measure and sort of bombard them with radiation and count count the mutations. That doesn't work. So you look at. You do this to look at selection, and selection takes place over a very long period. How do I know? Well, I, I ca you can you can trace the phylogeny back. So you know that the gene started off with a common ancestor and you can see how many changes there are compared to that common ancestor and which changes and where. So what we find if we look at gene expression is, is we find uh, expression differences between humans and chimpanzees in different tissues. We actually find that the divergence in brain is not very big. It's one of the smallest ones. You get a bigger divergence in heart, a bigger divergence in liver, and a huge divergence in the testes. So the patterns of evolution, they're affecting things which are different from the things which we humans tend to think. We tend to think our evolution has focused on giving us a big brain. It seems to have focused on giving us a different sex life, which is really a different thing. Yeah. That's interesting. You know, this is part of the sexual bias of modern science because they just don't give the numbers for that. So I can't tell you, but what you say theoretically for me strikes me as being obviously true. Yeah, and we, and we, have, we have hidden ovulation and all these things. It's, a, it's an extremely good point, and they don't mention it in any of their graphs there. You know, it's very, it's very common, actually. There's a huge debate going on in the ethical world about, about research, like people only use male animals. We only, in our lab, we only use male mice. And scientists do it. It's more convenient. They don't have a cycle. You can do it all the time, and blah, blah, blah. But a lot of, I think this information really would be needed. It would be an extremely good theme of research for somebody. I, I'm going to look in Google Scholar tonight and see if anyone's written on it. But I don't know, and I've not seen any data about that. So it's a, it's a really good point. Uh, let's just look at a couple of things where we know that there has been positive selection. Uh, if there's two genes, one is ASTM, one is MCPH1, which are both involved in brain size. If you have, if you have a, um, a mutation in one of these two, two genes, you get an abnormally small brain. And there's whole families which have mutations in these genes and have unusually small brains. We also find that the correct form of these genes is selected for positively, both going from gibbons, so that's from lower primates to great apes, and again going from chimpanzees to humans. So yes, on this specific gene, there does seem to be selection in favor of a gene which is involved in getting us bigger brains. And the same thing applies for another gene. It's another microencephaly gene. Um, you get the same thing from monkeys to apes and from gibbons to great apes, not from great apes to humans. So it does seem as though positive selection for brain size does exist. In other words, I don't want to exaggerate it. Sex life might be more important, but brains do exist. And yes, they are important. And yes, there seems to have been selection for bigger brains. Uh, 
A second gene, this is a, a very, very interesting story. How many of you have heard of FOXP2? It's one of the most famous genes in the whole genome. So, this gene was discovered uh, in a family in London, I think about 10 or 15 years ago. And members of this family have a mutated form of the gene, and they all suffer from gross language defects. Now, first thing for the non-geneticists, non-biologists among you, the fact that a, a mutation of a gene gives you a defect does not mean theoretically in any way that this is the cause of the capability. So, POXP2, you mutate it, you get a problem in language. That does not mean that language depends on POXP2. You know, take an example. If I take my car and I detach the wire from the battery, the car will no longer start. This does not mean that that wire to the battery is the cause of the car starting. You know, it's, it's, it's one part of a very complex system which does it. Fox P2 is presumably one part of a very complex system which gives us language. Now, we started off with Fox P2 by doing correlative studies. And they discovered that Fox P2 is also expressed in the brains of songbirds. Very, very nice. And in songbirds which learn songs culturally. Even nicer. Uh, and it appears that if you get mutations in this gene, you have problems in being able to make a very fast orofacial movements. And if you remember when we talked about speech in uh, lecture number three, very fast orofacial movements is key to human pronunciation. So, this also sounded very, very good. And uh, it's, highly, it's a highly conserved gene between, between rodents and primates, but the human version is really special, and there are some signs of positive selection using the measures we used before. So this is a really nice story. Uh, and I'm not going to say it's wrong. I'm just going to say it needs complicating a little bit. So what do we now do? Nearly every bit of evidence I've shown you on every field has been correlational so far. It's been almost impossible. I've hardly ever shown you a causal relationship. But Ennard, who's a very clever guy, decided he was actually going to prove, the f or he's, he was actually going to look causally at what this gene could do. So he used the gene, gene engineering techniques, and he expressed this gene in mice. So he found that if you put the human version of the gene into the mice homozygously. Uh, no, sorry, if you knocked it out in mice, if you knocked it out in the mouse, the mouse died. So you need, even a mouse needs this gene in order to survive. But when he expressed the human, a humanized version of the gene in the mice, they were healthy and happy and lived just as long as other mice. And he then started uh, doing a comprehensive screening of the phenotype expressed by this gene. And he found lots and lots of different effects whose interpretation, even he, he just reports them. He doesn't interpret. So they, they had less exploratory behavior. They were more social than other mice. Uh, they had reduced expression of dopamine in some circuits. They had long-term depression, which has nothing to do with mood depression. This is a form of learning in the synapses was increased, their dendritic trees was a bit longer, and great finding, they squeaked differently. Now, what that means, who knows? Uh, so this, these were results which are interesting. So it proves this, uh, this gene has an effect, but linking that to language is really tough. You know, what was it doing to these mice? We really don't know. But he's just recently produced a new paper uh, it's this year, and it appears, this is much more, I find this much, much more interesting. It's using the same, the same transformed mice. It appears that it drastically increases the transfer of memory from declarative memory to procedural memory. So you teach the, you, you, you teach the, uh, the mice to do a motor task, and you overtrain them so they don't have to think about it. They automate the task, just like you automate learning to drive. And this is much faster, I think it's threefold faster, in the genetically manipulated mice than in other mice. 
So possibly they haven't found the language gene. Obviously, it's a gene which is expressed in so many different ways. But this is a it's a really interesting gene. And interestingly, uh, you, you probably know that um, last year they finally sequenced, or 12, 2012 maybe, they finally sequenced the Neanderthal gene genome and the Denisovan genome. And FOXP2 is present in its modern form in both, which is really nice. It's not present in the great apes in the humanized form. So this is a tiny, tiny piece of evidence that conceivably our language could, with so many buts and ifs and everything else, could be much more ancient than we think. Like we know, we're pretty clear that language is at least 100,000 years old because we find features of language which are universal in all cultures and they separated more than at least 100,000 years ago. So these are universal features, so they were probably already present in this early ancestor of modern human beings. But now with the data, the, P the Fox P2 data for, for Neanderthals and for Denisovans, it seems as though just possibly it was present a long time before. So language has really been going for some time, or maybe some proto-language which used the same basic cognitive and motor skills as modern language, but which was maybe less sophisticated. But that's deep, deep speculation because the data is not there. We have no knowledge of language in these early periods. So, summing up, we've seen that humans are different. We have different life histories. We learn for much longer. Humans are different because we have very big, fast brains. Humans, genetically, we have some differences and they are connected to these things. We have, we have positively selected genes for, for late stages of development, for learning and so forth. But the differences shouldn't be dramatic. So certainly everything we've seen here in neuroanatomy and genetics plays a role in human being, humans being special. But I don't think on its own it provides a complete explanation. We need other elements. So in the na last two lectures I'm going to give, I'm going to be talking about those other elements. Uh, tomorrow, I'm going to start talking about cumulative cultural evolution in more detail, about human cultural diversity, about the way in which cultural evolution can affect our cognition without changing our neurobiology, about the way humans have colonized the world, about what some anthropologists have called have called the cultural niche and the way this can affect human evolution. So uh, we're finally going to start talking about causation and no longer about just fa raw facts. Then in the final lecture, I'm going to look methodologically. About I'm going to go back to my original hypotheses and I'm going to propose a strategy there whereby we can actually test these hypotheses. I'm going to try and convince you that it's a reasonable strategy and I'm going to try and get your suggestions for making it better. So, that's all for today. Are there any questions? I silenced them? Okay. Well, uh, same time, same place tomorrow. Thank you very much.